Good morning or good afternoon and welcome to IEP2's learning webinar. Um, we're super excited today to be able to welcome uh, participants from Canada, the United States, Aust Australia and New Zealand. It's always a pleasure to have people from worldwide. Um, we're expecting a wonderful webinar today with Facilitation Matters. Um, as many of you are aware, we um, are enjoying bringing back some of the sessions that we uh, that took place at our conferences and this one is from Montreal so we're super excited about bringing them back as we've done with some of our past sessions and also we're going to be doing in July and August as well uh, these are sessions that were really strongly evaluated at the Montreal conference and people said you know others should have this opportunity to get to see really some of the wonderful stuff that's happening at the conference and of course with that being said we're hoping that many of you you can join us in Denver from September 6th to the 8th, where we'll be having many more sessions as well as Pathways, which is something new for us this year. So, Drew, as we're getting ready to get going, I think I'm going to hand it over to you, and you can run people through some of the housekeeping items, and then we're going to be introducing Kate and Rebecca, and we'll go from there. So, Drew, first of all, over to you. All right. Well, as Amelia said, uh, this is one of the more highly regarded uh, uh, presentations from the Montreal uh, um, conference last last September, and so we're encouraging people to, uh, to to make this a very interactive one. I think you'll find Kate and Rebecca have got a lot of interactive things they want you to do. So to help get you into that mood, uh, we've got some polls that uh, they'll be asking in just a few minutes, and we encourage you to take part in those. And also, by all means, ask questions, make comments. We don't have a set question and answer period at the end. We tend to take questions and comments on the fly. And so if you want to uh, make a comment, you can do it one of two ways. We'll have all your microphones muted. So please don't bother with muting them on your own. We'll keep them muted on this end. And if you want to ask a question verbally, click that little yellow hand icon off to the side in your control panel. We'll see your hand go up and we'll come to you, we'll unmute your microphone, and you can ask the question when it's appropriate during the, uh, the, the presentation. Also, uh, if you would rather just type it in, if you're one of these shy types who, who get scared of the microphone, um, just type it into the question box, and Amelia will break in when it's appropriate and ask the question for you. So those are ways you can make this interactive. Uh, we're going to be recording this. And so for your professional uh, development, you want to go back and, and review this, we'll send you the link to the recording as soon as it's online, you can, and you can do that. There's lots of collateral material that Rebecca and Kate have uh, sent us, and we'll be passing those along to you. They'll also be posted on your respective uh, affiliate websites, too, in the members-only sections. And the other thing is we have a, a survey that we'll send out afterwards. And uh, there's uh, some questions about, you know, how we can make these webinars better and any ideas you've got for future webinars. We're always into hearing more about that. So we hope you sit back, enjoy this one, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing what Rebecca and Kate have to say. Amelia, back to you. Thanks so very much, Drew, and I really encourage everyone, this is meant to be interactive, and I know that both Kate and Rebecca are hoping to hear from you, so please take advantage of the different ways that you can become involved. So as mentioned, a big welcome on behalf of IP2 USA, Canada, Australasia, um, and now it's my opportunity to introduce our two guests. Kate Bishop is the Supervisor of Community Engagement, City of Guelph, Ontario, where she led the development and implementation of the city's first community engagement framework, policy, and program in 2014. Currently, she manages this program to support corporate priorities and project in service areas across the organization. Kate has over 20 years of experience working and volunteering in a variety of nonprofit and government organizations in Ontario and Nunavut. She has developed and managed collaborative community partnerships, programs, and projects with diverse community stakeholders, citizens, and board of directors. Kate holds a master's degree in adult education and community development with a specialization in workplace learning and change management. She is committed to continuously improving community engagement and learning resources that support staff to create innovative strategies which focus on citizens as key participants in municipal policy and service decisions. So welcome, Kate. 
And joining her today is Dr. Rebecca Southerns. And, and Rebecca is the CEO of uh, Sage Solutions, a facilitation and consulting firm based in Guelph, Ontario, Canada, that helps mission-driven leaders align what's important to them with what they actually do. She brings over 20 years of experience to the boards, executive directors, leadership teams, and community coalitions with which she works, offering a combination of insight, strategic clarity, and time well spent. She's a quick learner, creative thinker, and astute analyst known for designing and engaging learning processes, whether in public meetings, across a coaching table, or in classroom. Rebecca holds a PhD in Sustainable Communities and a Master's in Public Administration with a focus on nonprofit governance. She teaches community engagement and public planning and facilitation skills at two universities and offers advanced facilitation skills training and coaching to practitioners. Rebecca is also recently back from a three-month sabbatical with her family, which she would be also be pleased to tell you about. So maybe someone will ask that question, Rebecca, as we head into this. Mm -hmm. Before we get going, we actually want to find out a little bit about who is in the audience today. So, Drew, let's get those poll questions out there and let's find out who's joining us. All right. So, the first question is up. Where are you? So, are you in Canada, the U.S., or are from somewhere else? So, if you could just take a couple of seconds just to answer that quick question. And we're going to close that down in a minute. And as I said, if you're from somewhere other than Canada or the U.S., don't hesitate to let me know by putting it in the question box. Okay, Drew, let's see where people are from. All right. So we've got 18% uh, from Ontario and East. We've got 55% Canada, Manitoba, and West. Uh, in the U.S., 5% uh, East of the Mississippi. And in the U.S., 21% west of the Mississippi. And we know it's pretty early elsewhere in the country. So hopefully we'll get our Australians and New Zealands joining us soon. So let's get the next question up there, Drew. So what line of work are you in? Please just select one. We know that you might be in multiple. But, um, but just select one at the moment. Although if you want to tell us something else, please don't hesitate to put that in the question box as well. All right, Drew, let's close that and let's see what line of work they're in. All right, so Kate and Rebecca, we've got 36% working at the local or municipal government level, 12% at the provincial, state, or federal level, 36% from the private sector, 12% are solo consultants, and 4% are or but I don't see any responses in the question box yet. But if I see them, I will certainly let you know. All right. And Drew, I think we've got one last question just to find out a little bit more. Oh, we did get a response. Nonprofit. So that, those are the other sectors that people are in are in the nonprofit sector. All right. Third question. What facilitation or P2 activities do you tend to do? And at this time, check all of them that apply. All right, Drew, let's close this and let's see what people are doing. All right, 89% do stakeholder design stakeholder engagement, 89% direct facilitation or run meetings, 40% hire consultants or facilitate, or, or facilitators, sorry, 30% partici participate as a citizen, and other is 6%, and I do have a response here, so let me just check this out. A developer of online engagement platforms. So, uh, so that was one of the, of the others that uh, people are involved in. So Kate and Rebecca, you know a little bit about the people that are out there now. So now we're going to turn it back to you. And as I said, if people have any questions as Kate and Rebecca are um, delivering their presentation, uh, don't hesitate to raise your hand or pop it in the question box. Thanks so much. Kate and Rebecca, over to you. Thanks, Amelia. This is Kate, and welcome, everybody. Uh, we're very excited to be here this afternoon and our time um, this morning in, in, on the Pacific Coast. Um, 
And we just thought we'd mention one, one thing really quickly, um, and that's about our relationship, Rebecca's and mine. And um, Rebecca is an independent facilitator in the Guelph area, and three out of the four case studies that we're sharing with you today uh, Rebecca has been involved in. So uh, different projects and different project leads at the city have hired Rebecca to help them with their facilitation processes. Um, so that's a little bit about a little bit more about the two of us. Uh, and we're going to move on one sec to today's agenda. So um, what we thought we'd start with is a really quick understanding of what, what facilitation is for us and why uh, it's important to be using a facilitator in some of our public engagement uh, events. Uh, we want to talk about where we're starting from, basically our assumptions. Um, we want to give you a really brief overview of the four, four case studies of in-person uh, facilitation that we are sharing with you. Uh, and that are in the information uh, in the resource package that will be available to you after this webinar. Um, we also want to share four strategies that will help you plan successful engagements uh, for uh, plus two <laughs> targeted tools that we would uh, like to share with you. And finally, um, four practical pathways to uh, outcomes that we think are worthwhile when uh, facilitating uh, in-person events. So this is Rebecca, and again, I'd like to add my greeting to Kate's. Um, thank you for having us. We, don't, we do want to mention that the irony of talking about in-person facilitation based on an in-person workshop that is now being presented as an online webinar is not lost on us. So we've tried to uh, adapt it as best we can. So I hope that it works for you today, um, recognizing that uh, you know, our intention is to give you a flavor for what it feels like in a more interactive and in-person setting. Just very quickly, in case the word or, or field of facilitation isn't familiar to you, I know from your feedback that most of you are directly involved in this already, so we're certainly not going to belabor it. But I wanted you to note that in the package when you download these uh, tools, there's a video called What Do Facilitators Do? that you may find a useful tool um, when you're describing this to people, and it goes through how a facilitator plays different roles at different times, that of an architect, a navigator, a pilot, and a guide. So you may want to use that video to talk about facilitation, which really means to make things easier. And a, a facilitator does provide a structured series of activities or conversations to help guide a group of people to a shared result that they themselves have created and understood and accepted together. And I guess one of our key points here is that simply having an agenda or a chair of a meeting is not enough. Facilitation is actually more than that. Um, and it's a particular expertise that people bring to a space that allow a group to work effectively together. So when we think about when and why we would want to use uh, a facilitator at the City of Guelph, we really think about, um, is this a really contentious issue? And if it is, we often suggest to our colleagues that uh, we would use um, an external uh, facilitator, not someone inside the city, uh, to host or um, facilitate a meeting because it's more likely that an external facilitator would be mm, perceived to be unbiased in the eventual outcome of, of, of that event or uh, engagement process. Um, we also recognize that facilitation is a very specialized skill and a lot of the people in a municipal setting uh, don't have those skills. They've been hired for uh, their technical expertise and in fact they're not really comfortable at all with facilitating public meetings and public events. So having a, a second, a, a special person there to facilitate the meeting in the, um, frees technical staff up to be what they are and that is to provide answers uh, and information around technical, um, te technical aspects of the project. The other time we may need to hire an external facilitator or bring someone else in from uh, internally from uh, within the organization is if there's just um, not uh, anybody that has the time to develop and design 
the meeting or the event um, on the project team. So having set that kind of context, what we want to do is really give you a sense of our starting point with this and where this, um, the impetus for this workshop came from. Four things. One is that we really feel that if people are bothering to show up to an in-person event, um, we need to make it worth their time. We know that they have lots of competing priorities. And uh, this is true not only for in-person events, isn't it, but for online engagement as well. If people are willing to engage with us on a particular conversation or topic, we want to make sure that it's planned really well to, to meet the purposes for which it's intended to be an engaging experience, really to make it worth it. And so you're going to hear some ideas today that um, come from that place of really wanting to honor people's time. The second thing is that intentional facilitation is key, both ahead of time and once you get in the room, whether that's an in-person space or a virtual space, that facilitation requires planning and intention. It's a deliberate activity, and as I said before, having an agenda alone is not enough. We therefore think it's really important that we pay attention both to the content of a meeting or a session and also to the experience. And so content objectives and experiential objectives, what's it going to be like to participate in that event? Uh, need to be taken into consideration in the planning. And then finally, it's our assumption and a belief that well-facilitated meetings can increase participants' trust, can increase their input, and can, can increase their interest. And so we're going to talk about each of those three elements as we move through this. So last fall in Montreal at our workshop, we actually had um, a, a copy of the four case studies that we're going to be referring to um, on each table, but we can't do that today. So um, we're going to really briefly give you an overview of each of the case studies, uh, but they are there are more detailed um, discussions of these case studies in the information or the resource package. Um, so the first case study we want to talk about is a traffic calming uh, project that was um, identified by City Council uh, who directed staff to look at traffic calming that would enhance safety and accessibility for all road, road users. Um, basically, this was uh, something that had been identified and come out of a bicycle lane um, engagement process earlier. So two workshops were developed and an online survey and information to support those workshops. Uh, and the second case study that we are going to talk about is the development of a community hub in an existing city park. And so staff wanted to meet with residents living adjacent to that park before the community hub committee engaged broadly with local residents. So uh, we designed two open houses um, to, to focus on that particular stakeholder group. The third case study came out of a regularly scheduled bylaw review. Um, at the city, there's a schedule by which you know, different bylaws are reviewed every several years. And what they did in this particular example that related to responsible pet ownership and animal control was that they were combining several very outdated and disparate bylaws into a single one. And what they did was they struck a multi-stakeholder community working group. And that group had actually met for almost two years um, at the point that they asked me to be involved in um, conducting public meetings that were then supplemented by an online survey to review their suggestions of how that new draft bylaw might look. And it ended up actually being uh, the online survey that has received the most responses of any that anyone at the city could remember. So this clearly was a hot topic for people, uh, ranging from cat and dog ownership through to pot-bellied pigs and snakes whose names I couldn't pronounce. So we were uh, working through a process of combining multiple means of engagement, both in person and online, to get people's feedback into a, a new bylaw that was ultimately accepted by City Council. Then the final case study was um, the development of a community investment strategy. This was taking the diverse ways that the city engages with actors in the nonprofit sector and trying to develop a more consistent and transparent and defensible framework for those various kinds of agreements to be made. It was a fairly complex, long project. And for one particular part of it, we developed some interactive town hall style meetings in a very large space that had multiple activity stations at them using different kinds of engagement tools to get 
uh, feedback from citizens. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we get to it in the presentation. But that just gives you a sense when we're saying things like animal control or traffic calming or community investment, these are the case studies we're referring to. And as Kate said, when you uh, receive the package that's going to be posted online, you'll get a better sense then of uh, the details of this, including some of the engagement goals that were associated with it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move into four um, strategies, four examples uh, drawn from all of these case studies that will give you some really practical messaging examples and tools related to what initially was in-person facilitated engagement, but I think can actually apply to virtual and mixed environments as well. So the first one, our core message is to think like an event planner and answer at least the five W's of who, what, what, when, where, why, and actually how, just like you would if you were sending an invitation to someone, uh, say, to a birthday party or a wedding. It wouldn't occur to you to host a party with, that has an old school invitation or something on Evite maybe, Eventbrite, uh, without explaining what it's for or who's going to be there or what you should bring or how you should prepare or um, where you should have it. And so things like, it sounds really basic on an invitation to say, yes, of course we're going to have the time or the location. Um, and that's true. But it's a very helpful um, planning metaphor, really, to think about if I were throwing a party, what would I do? Because many of us have planned, you know, if it's not a wedding, then at least a birthday party or two in our day or a dinner party, um, to think about what some of those key elements are. Um, not just because we want people to show up, but actually because, and you'll see this at the bottom of the slide here, that attention to detail increases trust. So you don't want to give people an opportunity to think, wow, if they can't even get the small things right, like explaining where this is or when it starts or why we're meeting, how is it that I can trust them with the planning of our city or whatever the content might be? And so. Um, we would really encourage you to go through very systematically each of the elements that you might include in an invitation um, in your planning of the event. And you'll see uh, that's not just the time and location, but it's actually really thinking about the venue. Where do we want to hold this event? What time of day or time of the week makes sense? Who really needs to come? And have we advertised this in a way that gets them there? Um, so there's lots of different places or lots of different aspects of event planning that can actually speak to facilitation um, to help you do those logistics but also to build the trust of your participants. I'm happy to answer more questions about the specifics of those elements but that's the general um, message at this point is that when you are a facilitator be thinking like an event planner. And Rebecca, maybe that was a really good segue for me just to quickly pop in and say, if you have any questions, as I said, please don't hesitate to put them in the question box, and we'll make sure that we pop in and ask Rebecca or Kate. Back to you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I want to talk just briefly about the, the traffic calming workshops that we designed. Um, we did some really great things in terms of event planning. For example, we ha held the workshop, both workshops, uh, in the local school. So we were bringing the workshop to the neighborhood where people lived that were going to be impacted by uh, any decisions that we made around traffic calming. Um, that was great. We had to um, bring in tables and chairs. We had to rent tables and chairs because the school didn't have what we needed. Um, one of the things that happened there that we didn't uh, plan for was the tables and chairs from the rental company ended up being filthy. So we had to clean everything before we um, actually set them up in the, in the gymnasium of the school. Um, we, we, we had a good relationship with the janitors there, so it all worked out. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the other things that happened um, that we didn't realize until we were actually in there cleaning the chairs in the first uh, workshop was that um, signage had been uh, put out on a, a main intersection at the local YM, YM, YWCA, great, great way to advertise, except the company that did the signs um, put the wrong time on the sign, and nobody lived in that neighborhood, and so nobody that was uh, involved in um, 
setting up the meeting uh, and designing the meeting, so nobody noticed that the sign was incorrect and the times on the sign were incorrect. So we didn't figure that one out until people started arriving about an, uh, 45 minutes early for our meeting, which was a bit of a problem. And then at the meeting itself, um, we really didn't anticipate uh, that there were going to be quite as many people turning up to that uh, first workshop. So we had refreshments, but we didn't have enough cups for people. And um, people were kind of disappointed, ticked, I think maybe. And again, um, attention to that kind of detail really uh, makes or ensures that people feel good about the decisions that uh, they are contributing to and that um, the recommendations that staff were making. I was realizing as I reread these slides that it does sound a little on the negative side in terms of that example. <laughs> I hope you don't mind our candor with this, but they're just good examples of even when you're dealing with uh, experienced facilitators, experienced municipal employees, good planning, lots of meetings, lots of thought, we still miss things, don't we? And um, developing that skill of anticipation and double checking and really channeling your inner event planner can make a huge difference. Um, you'll see, I'm just gonna run through two things. We're not gonna read the details of them, but when you download the package that will come with this webinar, you're gonna find a couple of tools there that I hope you do find useful. One is a space planning checklist. It's bigger than this. I'm just showing you the, the top of it so you'll recognize it. Um, I really advocate treating a venue or the meeting space as a planning variable, selecting it very carefully to enhance the uh, achievement of the purposes of your event. So you're going to see a space planning checklist that I hope you find useful. And then uh, also this one. Um, I've included uh, an engagement event setup checklist that we've created for ourselves and our colleagues at the City of Guelph. Um, a lot of some of the same things that Rebecca mentioned mentions in her space checklist are included here. We, we have on the first page, this is just a small portion of it at, on the very beginning of the first page, um, the event overview. But then on the second page, we look at um, things that need to be done well in advance of the event, sometimes up to a month in advance of the event. Um, and then things to be done on the day before or the day of the event. And finally, things to be looking to do during the event and um, after the event is over. So those are, will be in your resource um, uh, package as well. So the second thing that we wanted to talk about um, to, today with you is uh, the idea of honoring the in, uh, information exchange. Um, people's ex expectations sometimes differ from what we're thinking um, that we're, we're going to provide. Um, it's, and it's often very difficult to uh, anticipate what people's expectations are. Uh, sometimes, if you can, uh, the best way to do that would be to uh, talk to some key members of the stakeholder community, uh, the neighborhood, and ask them themselves about what they might, uh, how they might like to be engaged, what might be the best way to engage them. Um, if you anticipate what people want development of a hub in a local neighborhood where we tried to where we engaged uh, wanted to engage uh, with a very targeted group of stakeholders those people living adjacent to a park that we were thinking of building a, a new community hub in and we wanted to do that and get to those people before the local um, or the neighborhood community hub committee engaged more broadly with the neighborhood residents um, so we we uh, thought we were going we were going to uh, hold two open houses that's what we planned for and um, when we got to the first open house in an evening we planned for them on two different days so that we could meet as many people's needs as possible uh, the people that came to the open house were very very agitated very upset and didn't want the open house format wanted a presentation with a, a Q&A uh, at the end of it. Um, now, I don't always recommend that just because people don't like what you've got planned for them that you change it, but it was um, 
decided at that the end of that first open house that we would pull together a presentation and um, a Q&A session. And so we did change midstream. And that kind of flexibility is sometimes not appropriate, but sometimes it's absolutely essential uh, to meet the needs of people uh, that, are, that you're wanting to um, get feedback from and engage with. Because you really do want to increase goodwill and openness and satisfaction. And so we want to reduce any barriers to that, whether that's a planning detail that we maybe didn't think of or an anticipated reaction that we gauged incorrectly ahead of time. And so that idea that accurate anticipation has the potential to increase satisfaction is really important. And also um, posture, like sort of assuming um, a willingness to adapt, as, as Kate has described, that the city was willing in that case to adjust its plans for the second event to be responsive to the community. And, and one of the things that that did was to sort of calm some frayed uh, nerves and frustrations at that time that the city was in fact being responsive to people's concerns, not just in terms of the content, but in terms of how that content is delivered. And so what I'd like to do now is to show you a couple of tools that we have developed for you that again will be in your package that might help with this. The first one has to do with um, mapping out what you plan to do with how you advertise that with what in turn a resident or participant might then think. So if you look down the middle column of the slide you're looking at, if you have something that talks about an information night and you're, being, uh, you're inviting people to come and learn more, you're going to be setting them up to anticipate a presentation. You don't really want to have them come to an event advertised that way and say to them, so tell us what you think. There may be an opportunity for that, but they're going to come expecting um, to be able to learn something about that. And, and although they may want to give their input, they may not know if they're supposed to in that format. Whereas if you look at the second one in the middle column, it's very clearly advertised as an open house and an opportunity to share your ideas about a new initiative. Neither of these is necessarily problematic. We're simply making the point that what you plan to do should align with what you advertise, should in turn align with what you anticipate participants to um, be assuming or expecting when they show up. And a disconnect in either of those places um, will has the potential to decrease satisfaction and increase agitation at an event where you actually want to do the opposite. So um, be careful about basically how you advertise and make sure that it aligns really well with your expectation and theirs because partly we're anticipating expectations, but partly we're shaping them by how we communicate. And so make sure that your communication is in fact shaping those expectations. Then the second tool in this scenario, or in this, um, sorry, this example, is a planning tool called planning for multiple scenarios. And I'm not going to go into the details of this slide other than to say that if you as a facilitator plan for plan A, you might also want to plan for B or maybe C or maybe D. And certainly B, C, and D are less detailed plans than A. But uh, if you have multiple possibilities in your mind in terms of a process, in terms of a uh, participant reaction, in terms of maybe what the venue will or won't facilitate you doing, you're going to be more nimble and agile to make change as things go unexpectedly. And they almost always do. And so if you're holding really tightly to one particular script, it's going to be very hard for you to shift gears into other scripts. And so if you know that you're someone that needs a script and needs to cling to it pretty tightly, I would encourage you to write multiple scenarios. Even if you're someone who's really flexible with your script, the exercise itself of planning for these scenarios allows you to walk into that room acknowledging that lots of different things can happen and you're going to be ready, more ready than you otherwise would have been had you not planned for those scenarios to adjust to whatever it is that actually greets you in real life. So those are two scenarios. We have two others. But before we do that, we're going to have you get involved here. We just wondered if any of you would like to share a brief example of a meeting uh, or a planning element you, you wish in hindsight that you would thought uh, of in advance. So something that you um, maybe missed and uh, wished in hindsight you'd thought of or did differently. Well, I'm waiting for people to raise their hands, but, but maybe I'll kick start with, with one of my examples. Um, 
I thought that I had have, had everything really well planned for the meeting. I, you know, we we'd got all of the um, the subject matter experts in place. We talked about what their roles were going to be. We had the boards ready. The invite had gone out. Everything we thought was in really good shape. Um, but what I hadn't done was to actually check the level of emotion that might potentially have been in the room. And I had been told by all of my colleagues. This shouldn't be a problem. It should be an easy meeting. We haven't had a lot of pushback on it. We think maybe 40, 50 people are going to show up. And uh, it was due to start at 7 o'clock. By 6 o'clock, we had 50 people lined out the door. By the time the meeting was getting going, we had almost 200. Um, oops. So just wanted to share that with you. <laughs> <laughs> And sometimes even, as, I mean, best laid plans, right? I mean, we, one example I use all the time is that I, as a facilitator, I, I tend to make things visual. So I use wall space a lot, and I've come to ask my clients, you know, is there decent wall space? And, you know, a couple times they've, they've said yes, and what's happened is when I've gotten there, in one case it was an art gallery, and so there was really expensive art on the wall. So yes, there was wall space, but it was covered by expensive paintings. And in another case, we were meeting in a really funky um, wine cellar space, and there was lots of wall space, but the walls were made of sort of rubble, old limestone rubble. So they were rough, and uh, there was no possibility that anything remotely re resembling a flip chart piece of paper or a post-it note or anything like that could be attached to the wall, much less written on while it was there. So sometimes even asking your questions, I now know that I have to ask if there are smooth, empty walls, not just wall space available. Great. So we've got a, we've got a uh, Kathy has raised her hand. So I'm just going to open up Kathy's mic so she can ask it directly of you. Kathy, over to you. I was going to give an example. Does that make is that what you're looking for? We sure are. Okay. So I have two. The first is I um, hold a monthly meeting at a local um, center, and the gentleman who was supposed to meet me earlier forgot to come early, and it was winter. And I was standing outside for probably about 45 minutes until he showed up. So in hindsight, I wish I had gotten his personal cell phone number because I had no way to get in touch with him to, you know, remind him that he actually was supposed to be there to, to let me in to, to set up. Um, and the other quick example is I um, hold meetings monthly for lots of groups at different facilities and this one excuse me, local college offered to host us and it was really lovely and when I showed up she had tea and coffee and drinks and food which was lovely but I had all the same stuff that I had packed and planned. Um, so she apologized and said, oh I should have told you I was, you know, going to have all this stuff and then I thought to myself oh, and, and I should have asked her because I just assumed as always I would bring the you know, the refreshments for folks. So those are two things that I've learned. Thanks for that, Kathy. That's, uh, that, they're really good examples. And um, I think that's something that, that we try and do increasingly uh, with um, our facilitation plans when we're working internally with our colleagues is to have a very, very clear uh, roles and responsibilities section and who's bringing what and and uh, when are people arriving and all of those things need to be spelled out very clearly and um, they're often the things that we forget about. <laughs> Absolutely. So just a, there's a couple more in the uh, in the question box. So I'm just going to ask ans ask those and Pauline puts out a walls of windows as an example. Yeah. Mm. Um, <laughs> which is always a surprise when you show up. Although uh, coming to somewhere that has absolutely no windows is also equally problematic. Um, we do, I just want to let participants know that um, we do have quite a number of other questions in here. I haven't forgotten you. We are going to get to you, but we're going to get through a little bit more of the presentation and then I'm going to open it up for those questions. So please keep those questions coming and, uh, and, and we'll respond to those in a few minutes. Um, absolutely. Just a, an interesting one from Pauline, just sort of as an example of of, uh, of planning, and uh, and her comment was, uh, sorry, let me just get back to it again. I've just just lost it here. Um, apparently, I've got lots of questions here. Pauline's was. Um, 
One from us, participants are happy to help with setup if asked, so don't be afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. So whether or not you've ever included that in your, in your, in your setup or you're planning for your meeting. Uh, actually, people that arrive early often are very willing to do that and happy to have something to do. So yes, I have. <laughs> but maybe I'm a little bit bossy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, we're going we're gonna to come back. I don't see any other hands raised at the moment to actually pr uh, provide uh, responses, but we'll come back to the other questions in a few minutes. Back to you. Perfect. Thanks for that. So we're going to carry on with our other two messages here. And the next one is, it seems basic when I say it out loud, but it is to ask questions that people can answer. And what we mean by that is that respondents should be equipped to answer the questions being posed. And so, for example, um, you don't want to be asking really, really technical questions of a non-technical audience, as an example. And then the second part of that is the question should be crystal clear in terms of what they actually mean. And so we're going to walk you through a couple of examples here of ways that we tried to design um, engagement scenarios to give people really clear questions that they were actually in a good position to answer. So the first one comes from the traffic calming um, example that we mentioned earlier, and Kate's just going to tell you about that. And the actual booklet is available in the resource package for you. So this um, traffic complex, uh, calming booklet actually uh, included uh, background information about the project, definitions of traffic calming, and then went in to all the different options that were available and um, gave information, very technical information in a very, very plain language way. So for example, uh, some of the, the options were roundabouts, um, traffic circles, mid-block or in intersection chokers. Here um, in this one, we're looking at a neighborhood uh, traffic circle. And for each of the options that were available, we gave a definition, we gave a picture of what it looked like. We gave a definition. We talked about the relative cost. We didn't give a, a range of costs. We just gave a number of dollar signs, uh, one to five, uh, so that people could get an idea of the relative costs. We talked about the advantages, the disadvantages, and the criteria for using these or the effectiveness for, for each of these options. Um, and I think it helped people um, to not only um, understand in the workshop, we discussed this with them, but it was something that they could refer to as uh, they were going through and working through different parts of the workshop, and they could also take it home uh, so that if there were family members at home, they could be informed as well. It was also really great to um, post on our website uh, afterwards and uh, useful for people that were filling in the online survey. You'll see at the bottom of this slide that, that clear and appropriate questions, that people have the right amount of information to use to answer them, increases the reliability of the data. So I've been in a public meeting as a citizen where the questions were highly technical and then they asked people to give their opinion. And I knew from the vibe in the room that people really didn't even understand the question. And yet the responses were then used to inform policy as if those responses had a level of reliability that I know as a citizen they just didn't have because those in the room weren't in a position to answer them because they were talking about oh, just all kinds of technical legislative and housing development language that really didn't match the people in the room. Could I just jump mm -hmm. in again? I, I think that what one of the things that we're trying to say here is that the quality of your feedback that you get back from participants is equal to, equal to the quality of the information that you provide, and it has to be non-technical. It has to be plain language. So let me give you one other example you'll see um, on the screen here. So this was a, from the, the animal control bylaw meetings that I mentioned to you, and that is that this was the question. Please indicate if you support or do not support licensing for each of the following animals in addition to dog licensing. So it's already a bit of a convoluted preamble to the question. And if you think about yourself as a possible citizen in that meeting, and I said to you, so do you support or not support licensing of pot-bellied pigs or ferrets? You may be sitting there saying, I don't even know. I have no idea. I don't know. Do I like pigs? Do I own? Are there people that own ferrets? Are flock animals even a thing? And you're distracted by a bunch of things and you wouldn't necessarily even know how to answer them. 
What we did as a preamble to this was we gave people a one-pager at the in-person meeting that explained what is licensing, why would a municipality consider licensing, why might they reject licensing, what are some other comparable municipalities that have chosen to go the licensing route or not to, what kind of revenue projections are we looking at for whether this is a money maker or a net loss? All that kind of stuff was spelled out in a briefing paper that was about a page long. And then we took questions and answers. Then we gave people the question. So they didn't have it in front of them right away. They had that preamble first. Then they had the question. And then based on the questions that they asked us, when we put this same question on an online survey, we included the same preamble in addition to the Q&A part that people had asked about. So we made sure we used the in-person engagement to sharpen the online engagement to give people as much information as we could. So those preambles preceded each of the questions so that we had greater confidence in the reliability of the answers even to the online questions. Because some of the things were a little bit complex, the wording was a bit um, complicated, so we tried to give as much prior information as we could. So again, just another example of making sure people have the information they need to answer a question, how to mix methods sometimes, and also how to make sure your questions are worded very clearly. And we learned the hard way on this one that some of the questions really were not very clear, or that some of our uh, background information was not as accurate as it should have been based on some um, source documents that weren't as up to date as we'd been originally told. But in other ways, we were really thrilled with how it went because we did feel very confident in the reliability, of particularly of the in-person information because people felt really well informed and everyone had the same information on which to make those decisions. So we're going to move on to our final um, example here, and that is designed to engage. We mentioned at the beginning that if people are going to bother to come to your meeting, make it worth their time. And so it's not only about gathering from them the information you as a consultant or policymaker might need, but it's making that experience a worthwhile one for them. Um, and so our advice here is to design a process that includes a variety of ways to engage and making it fun, because you're then catering to different preferences in terms of how people like to engage with material and nobody likes to sit through boring meetings and so really thinking about that at the planning stage makes a big difference and we're going to give you two examples of how we did that. So back to the uh, traffic calming uh, workshop, the first one, we needed a way to bring all that were present onto uh, into an equal level of understanding about why we were here, what had happened in the past around uh, bike lanes and, and research that had been done since then so that everybody could uh, be on a level playing field. So we developed, uh, instead of a, a PowerPoint presentation to provide background information, we developed a, a really fun quiz uh, that helped everybody there um, get, get involved and, and understand some of the basics. There's uh, three questions that I've included here for you today. So the first one I, you've had a chance to look at. The next one, which was uh, which of the following issues um, did area residents not identify as a concern? And lastly, um, a question about the, the posted speed limit in along that road and what was the average speed being driven uh, done by the traffic uh, survey um, consultants that we'd hired. So that helped people to understand a little bit more. There were a number of other questions, it wasn't just these, and we had a little prize that we gave out and uh, people that have been involved in this uh, ish, on this issue in bike lanes and traffic coming along that street for a while who were present uh, really enjoyed showing their expertise to the uh, 70 or so people that were in the room, all the neighbors. So um, that was a there was a really fun way to get everybody involved, and even kids uh, could be involved. And again, it shows in the planning stages that it would have been really easy simply to put that up on the screen. You know, the average speed driven by cars on Downing Road is. But just putting it as a quiz made it a bit more engaging. And that's a choice that you make in your facilitation design early on. I just want to show you um, a tool that I often use um, when I'm thinking about designing sessions. Now, multiple intelligences work uh, may be something that many of you are already familiar with. It's come under um, some 
intense scrutiny lately, and, and there's some interesting articles uh, on various facilitation fora that I'm part of around this. And so if you're interested, you can pursue it. But it's initially based on Howard Gardner's work. And basically, the way that it gets translated in many schools, for example, or other kinds of um, facilitated environments, with kids, we talk about it as being multiple kinds of smart. And so I've included it that way in this particular diagram that you can see eight, and sometimes there are nine different kinds of smart listed. And it's just a helpful, quick planning tool to say, have I included what I call various kinds of smart in my design? Because my assertion is that variety increases inclusion. Because if you're not someone who responds well to being talked at for an hour, like we are sort of doing right now, which is <laughs> one of the limitations of this kind of um, medium. But if you're someone that really needs to see something or touch it or move, for example, you're going to be better able to engage with the material and give us your best as a participant if we've catered for that. And so I'm just going to walk through a couple of these that might be less familiar to you. I'm going to start, um, I'll start with the gray one, which is the visual spatial wedge that's kind of at, what, 11 o'clock there, 10 o'clock. Um, picture smart, that's visual spatial. So you might be someone who prefers to see information visually in front of you. And if I, as a facilitator, can do that for you, that will help you to engage. The next one is a little bit less known and also less common in the population. But you'll know you're someone who is musically smart. You may not be able to carry a tune or play a cello. But if you are someone who knows that you hum in your head a lot, if you're someone like me or like my mom who the kids are embarrassed by in a store in the mall because you're singing along with the music that's playing without even realizing you are, this might be your thing. So maybe when you were having to memorize things in a test when you were younger, you would put it to a rhyme or you would use a little mnemonic or some sort of acronym for something. You might be music smart. And it's a hard one to incorporate for some people into their meetings, but it might be something as easy as having music playing when people arrive and when they leave and on the breaks. And you'll know that you have some musically smart people in your room if you say to them partway through, hey, who remembers what song I was playing at the beginning? Your musically smart people will absolutely know what it was. And most of us will not have a clue that there was even music playing at all. Uh, moving along, the body smart folks, These are the, this is the bodily kinesthetic stuff. This is the people that love to move. These are the kids in a classroom that like to sit and bounce on a stability ball or some other movement-inducing piece of equipment. And these are the adults that like to fidget with things. They like to doodle. They like to play with Lego. They like to make things out of pipe cleaners. They like to get up out of their chair and move around. And so if you can include movement in your sessions, you will be better able to incorporate them in. The next one is people smart, and this is interpersonal. So these are the folks that want to be able to talk to other people in order to process what's happening. Um, so conversations, small groups, those kinds of things. As we move around the wheel, we've got word smart as well, and that's related to people smart, but this is the, the folks who find it easier to be able to talk things through and use language to articulate them, either in writing or, or visually. Logic smart, this is math, and you're thinking, oh, how do I incorporate math into my meetings? The math smart folks are the people that want times put to things, and they like things to be numbered and in order, and they're the people that if you have a way to make something quantifiable, do that, but make sure your, your adding is right, and you don't make a mistake with it because it'll distract them. So walking through an agenda in a sensible order, anything like a flow chart or a series of steps to accomplish something um, will appeal to those of us with logical smarts. Nature Smart takes us into um, a space where we really are the ones that want that wall of windows we were talking about earlier. These are the folks that want plants in the room. So I have a friend, a facilitation friend in the States who always brings a fake plant in her, in her suitcase when she's going places and sticks it on the table because these are the people that really love to get outside and go for a walk. Maybe you can have them go and do that, walk around and chat with something with a partner as an exercise. Maybe it's just seeing outside. Maybe it's simply having something that's alive in the room. And then self-smart is intrapersonal, and that's giving folks who need time to reflect and connect with their own values, their own personal rhythm, their own thinking on something, time to do that. A, a good facilitator I know calls it the introvert moment, where you, you allow people to think about things prior to asking them to give their opinion out loud in a group. And so I've run through those things very quickly, but the idea is there are various kinds of smart, and if you can incorporate, all of us have all of these in various degrees in our personality. But if you can incorporate maybe even just two or three more than you already do now, not necessarily all eight or nine, but think about your default because chances are you design according to what is 
most comfortable for you. So, and you probably have ones that you go, oh, I hate that. Those are the ones that you're probably going to leave out. So make sure that you are realizing there are people in the room that would have a different default setting than you. And so we're providing a bit of a tool for that, which I'll show you in just a moment, but Kate's going to tell us something first. I just wanted to mention uh, something about the body smart, uh, the uh, smart <laughs> type of smart. Um, at the city of Guelph, we have, uh, when we're facilitating, we have little plastic baskets that we keep um, uh, supplied with things like silly putty and little mini um, slinkies and doodling paper and um, a variety of different things that people can pick up and squeeze and play with while they're in our workshops or at our meetings. And we just bring these out and put them on the table so that if anybody there are a number of people that need to be moving in order to be listening. Uh, so they have, we help them facilitate that. And it raises, so a, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I'm just going to let you know, I'm just doing a quick time check. Uh, it's 5-2. Mm -hmm. We do go until quarter past the hour, but I've also got uh, quite a few questions here waiting. So just, just wanted to let you know. Great. We're just so done, because I was just going to say that knowing your audience is really important, because some of your audiences are going to love that basket of fidgets, and other ones are going to... Maybe, in a, um, you know, it might make them feel, I don't know, juvenile if they see pipe cleaners sitting there or something. And I had a friend who doesn't use those baskets in corporate environments, and yet when she did actually bring them out in a very sort of stodgy corporate meeting, they loved it. And so sometimes we don't really know whether stretching the limits of what we expect is going to go well or not well. And partly it has to do with you as a facilitator being authentic to who you are and whether you can pull it off. Because if you're comfortable with it, you can sell it to the group as a good idea. And if you're feeling like it's a bit lame, chances are your group will think it's a bit lame. So, um, you know, be a bit wise that way. And I just, obviously, this is the world's worst slide. I'm not expecting you to read the small font. But I just want you to see that we've given you a tool in your package that goes through those eight kinds of smarts, gives you a brief description of them, and then gives you two or three meeting-related tips of how to incorporate that smart into your meeting. So that'll be waiting for you when you download your package. So just to uh, wrap up here, I think um, there's four main things that we really want you to take away today. Um, that the idea that attention to detail and event planning really, if you, if you do a good job, it will help to increase uh, trust of people that uh, you're, you're trying to engage with. Um, it, at least it won't take away, it won't decrease the trust, that's for sure. Um, Accurate anticipation increases satisfaction. So as much as possible, try and find out as much as you can about your stakeholders, what they're looking for, how they want to engage. Um, thirdly, clear and appropriate questions increase the reliability of the data. So that idea that good feedback requires good information, and you need to be really, really clear that your questions are uh, going to – are stated in a way that will give you the feedback that you want. And finally, uh, what Rebecca's just been talking about is this idea of variety of different ways of uh, facilitating an in-person event and activities, a variety of different kinds of activities that uh, address or at least uh, think about uh, the um, different ways of learning and the, not learning, Rebecca said, different yeah. ways of SMART um, will increase inclusion in your in-person events. And so um, we've been mentioning the resource package. This is what you can uh, anticipate being provided with once you go to the link when this is uploaded. We've got a summary of the case studies we've mentioned with the goals that were related to them and the formats that were chosen. And then we've got those two checklists around space planning and event planning. We've got the two tools about um, how you advertise an event and aligning that with what you intend to do there and planning for option A, B, C, and maybe D when it comes to your facilitation agility. Um, and if, if you're interested in that, we do, um, through my company, we do quite a bit of agility training for facilitators so that you don't have to wait for things to go off the rails before you know what to do. And then we've got an, the, that traffic calming workbook Kate mentioned um, as an example of giving people the information they need to start at a level playing field when they walk in the room and don't need to feel that they are technical experts already in order to be able to participate fully. And then finally, that um, handout I just showed you on various kinds of smart. So those will be available on the IAP2 sites and also um, at the site 
associated with my company so that you can see them as required. And so as we wrap up, we've got one question for you, and I understand that you've got more for us, and we've got another 15 minutes or so to have a good conversation about that. We look forward to it. Um, but we would like to... Um, We'd really like to hear which of these tips or tools you feel you're might most likely to use in your practice or within your role, even within the next couple of months. Which of these um, observations or resources uh, do you think will be most immediately applicable for you? So if you wouldn't mind giving us some feedback on that, we'd appreciate it and are now happy to um, extend the conversation through whatever questions you'd like to address, Amelia. Great, thank you. Well, we do have quite a few, and Rika, I can see your hand up, so we're going to come to you in just a couple of minutes, but we're going to get a couple of other questions uh, done first. So the first one is from David, and you mentioned uh, it earlier on, uh, Rebecca and Kate, about when to facilitate. So to facilitate or not to facilitate, how do you decide whether a facilitative session is the right tool for your situation and at this point in time? I'd like to respond with a quick question. I'm wondering what the alternative to facilitation is because I'd find it easier to answer if it's a choice between facilitation and something else because if you think about facilitation as, at its simplest, running a really good meeting, I can't quite see a scenario where you wouldn't want to do that. If you're saying hiring an external neutral facilitator, that's a different kind of question. So I don't mean to be difficult, but I think my answer would change depending on what the other option might be. So... Um, I don't know what David would respond, but I'm going to ask hiring a neutral facilitator as against uh, using one of your own internal staff. Right. Um, so I think for us in, in the municipality, um, we, we would hire, we would highly advise if um, the issue is really contentious um, or if there's no one internally that feels equipped to lead a meeting, especially one that's highly contentious, uh, um, that would be the time that you would probably get um, an external facilitator that's, that's perceived as neutral. Um, it doesn't always help, um, but it's certainly, uh, in my experience of being uh, trying to facilitate a meeting that it is very, very um, heated and, and there are a lot of high emotions, um, people feel like uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not really, I, I, that I'm favoring the city, that I'm not neutral, and that I'm uh, shaping their feedback in a, in a way that wouldn't be accurate or wouldn't represent their feelings uh, accurately. I think the other reason, too, would be if you're wearing multiple hats in a meeting, and you want to be freed up to be a participant for whatever reason, say it's a strategic planning session, and you might have the skills to facilitate that really well, but you're also a team member who has a stake in what happens in that plan, and you'd like to be able to give your input just like everybody else around the circle gets an opportunity to do. That might be another reason to hire an outside person or bring somebody in from elsewhere in your organization who has good skills. So I think it's recognizing that it is a skill. It's not something... It's a set of competencies that not everybody has, has practiced and learned. But also, if you need to be freed up to play a different role in the room, you might want to invest in that. And I, I just thought of one other time, and that is often the project lead in, in our municipality uh, is, is um, expected to facilitate a public meeting, but that project lead needs to be present as a technical expert and to answer questions that might come up from uh, people that attend the meeting, and it's very, very difficult to be uh, to wear both hats. So, if you need people to be present as technical experts, then get someone else to facilitate the meeting. Terrific. So, we're just going to uh, a question from Kelly. I'd be interested in recommended learning resources and tricks of the trade for newer or beginner facilitators. Um, sure. The um, there's a professional association called the International Association of Facilitators. So that would be the first place I would go. They have a really nicely uh, newly revamped uh, toolbox of techniques that you can access. I don't know if it's members only or a certain portion of it is for members only, but I think some of it is publicly available. And you can search those by the nature of the tool you're looking for. Um, there's they, have a, they have a great uh, newsletter, and they send a lot of tools out on that. So that's a really nice um, professional resource to use. 
Um, when you, depending on where you're located, um, there certainly are firms that do facilitation uh, skill training. Um, but you'll also find on the IAF website, they have a list of, of professional competencies related to facilitation. And so you can at least look at those and say, hmm, yeah, actually, I'm pretty strong in some of these. I'm a little weak in others. And man, I could really use some shoring up. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, I also I just need to plug, Rebecca does online uh, facilitation training. That's really good. Sage Solutions. <laughs> <Thanks, laughs> I'll, I'll do that for Rebecca. <laughs> there you go, Kate. You can so, see that legitimately because she's taken both the courses, so she's a bit of a, a good advocate for them from experience, too, so I appreciate the plug. There you go. Sounds great. So, uh, interesting. We, we had a few more people respond to when when some examples and and Carla provides the rock band example with the rock band practicing upstairs um, mm -hmm. and you were going to be unaware of that and I think probably all of us have run into that at some point in time mm -hmm. so finding well. out what is happening else is happening in other locations close to your meeting is certainly important um, but Kelly brings up uh, consultation burnout and other related engagement events occurring at the same time and having those creep into your meeting um, can certainly also be an issue. Any thoughts on that particular one? Well, it's it's a it's a it's an issue, um, especially in a municipal world. You want to engage before the summer uh, months, July and August. So I find that uh, th and you and and then in order to get through uh, to the end of the. Um, fiscal year and complete all your projects, you need to probably uh, engage again in September, October. And I find that things reach a fever pitch over those four months. Um, and I'm not sure if Kelly uh, is thinking that uh, she has some similar experiences about that. So we do try and, and uh, encourage our colleagues increasingly to spread the engagement activities out. In our organization, it's sort of a, a shift in culture, and um, it's about talking, having conversations across the whole corporation about who's got what coming up at what time of the year, and those need to be done before the year ends so that you can plan for the next year. And we're increasingly starting to uh, do that at the City of Guelph because otherwise it does I agree. It can get pretty. Um, it can get pretty hectic, and I think that's the other reason why we wanted to emphasize that you really do make it worth people's time if they are engaging with you because they've got so many competing offers for their time. That that's another reason why I love doing what I do in terms of facilitation because I see it as a challenge to say how can I make this really really worth it to them. And so one of the things that we um, sort of promise is to stay very. Um, aligned with the purpose of the meeting and the purpose of any given chunk of the meeting so people really have a clear understanding of why they're being asked something or asked to do something and how that's going to be used. We also try to use their time really efficiently. So we try to use methods that are going to be um, high leverage or really sort of dense in their uh, ability to extract feedback or to get people engaged. And we try to piggyback on existing meetings. And so if I'm working with a board of directors, for example, I'm going to try really hard to come in for a strategic planning meeting to an existing board meeting because I would rather ask them to extend that meeting by an hour than to ask them to come in at another time. I'm also going to be really sensitive, as Kate alluded to, to the rhythm of the year and rhythm of the day. So if you're in rural communities and you're at harvest season, you will not get people to come. Or if you're in a place where winter storm season is highly likely, you need to be careful and be, you know, have your backup plans in place. Or if you're meeting with people from 4 to 7, you need to feed them. Um, things like that that just really honor the time of day or time of year that it is and make it really worth their time to show up. So I'm going to keep going with these questions because I think I've got about another eight questions and I know that we're running out of time here. Um, Rika, you had originally raised your hand and I've opened up your mic just in case you did want to ask your question directly. Um, but one of Rika's questions was, what are some effective or successful ways to facilitate meetings under 20 people? So, and take notes at the same time. So, Rika, did, did I get that right? Is there anything else you wanted to add there? Okay. So, she's not responding, so, uh, and her hand is now down. So, mm -hmm. any, any comments about under 20 people and taking notes at the same time? Sure, I'll just go real quick on that. There's, I, 
there's lots and lots of different ways to facilitate small groups, and so it's going to be really hard for me to give lots of tips without knowing more of the, the backstory. But um, I'll, I'll pick up on the note-taking piece. Um, I frequently am my own note-taker, not always, but often. And so one of the best ways I find to do that is to make, and it also picks up on the various kinds of smart, make people's feedback visual so that you don't have to do the notes in the session. So you can give them your full attention and they're writing things on post-it notes or I use a sticky wall and their feedback goes up visually. That way everyone can see it. I can take it home or take photos of it and then do the notes later. So I'm not sitting there with my nose in my notebook or behind my laptop. I'm actually facilitating but I've made it very visual and democratic in a sense so everyone's feedback gets put up visually for all to see. Um, that would be my, and then the other thing I use with that is I use color coded, I use colorful paper a lot, and the colors mean something. They mean something to me, they may not, I may not need to make that meaning explicit to the group, but I know if I'm doing a strategic planning exercise that I'm going to use one color for strategies and another color for objectives and another color for goals or whatever language I'm using for that strat plan, so that if, uh, as has happened to me, a gust of wind grabs my pile of notes and blows it out of the back of my car onto the driveway, when I collect it, I can tell just by the color of the paper what question that feedback was answering, um, and it's just another little geeky facilitation tip that I find helpful. Thanks. So from Kathy, something that we've been thinking through recently is the role of electeds in workshop format. Thoughts? Are you, I, I, I'm assuming that she's talking about elected politicians. So um, yeah, it, it depends, I think, on um, the, the, the municipality, but in our municipality, we're a tier one municipality. So that means that elected officials aren't full-time. Um, they're not in their positions full-time. And so our elected officials come and they observe and they talk to people at our in-person events, but they're very clear that they do not provide input. So uh, we encourage that and we encourage them to come and see how, how people are responding and see how we've been collecting their feedback, but um, they don't participate as, uh, as in providing feedback. Thanks, thanks very much, Kate. Rebecca, any thoughts on that? No, I think that probably does it for right now. I think we need to talk about the, the I guess let me say one thing. Um, Kate alluded earlier to responding to people's expectations and I think with elected officials that's one of the areas that I struggle with because elected officials do spend a lot of their time being given a podium and a, an opportunity to have the floor. And um, if I can avoid that, I do. Okay, thanks. So from Carla, uh, what should you do about protesters trying to hijack your meeting with signs and media in tow? Well, <laughs> I can't say that in the, uh, the medium-sized city of Guelph that we've got to uh, that point. And I think I know that it happens in larger uh, Canadian cities but I've never been involved in that. Uh, I think it's every um, engagement uh, um, professional's worst nightmare. Um, and I, I would say that uh, it, the, the gamut runs from shutting the meeting down if it's completely out of control and staff and, and participants, community members, um, uh, health and safety, uh, become an issue. But I also think that um, we have had uh, people that are particularly difficult at workshops and at meetings. And um, one of the things that we have used really uh, effectively is to uh, ensure that we have senior leaders at those meetings, uh, at least managers, uh, who can go and to one side and meet on them one-on-one -on -one in a separate space and allow the workshop itself to continue on with those people that do want to participate. And I think the other sort of zooming out piece when you think about conflict management is I'm a firm believer in the idea that good process trumps bad behavior. So if people feel heard, either at a small scale, it could be a tiny little meeting or a big, huge one, but if people feel that the process has allowed their voice to be heard, 
um, and that they've been engaged in meaningful ways and their own words have been used and that they've been really well respected and listened to, they don't feel the same need to be disruptive or to be behaving in a dysfunctional way. So that applies to a very small round table of meeting of people or it applies to protesters, you know, that um, well-designed engagement goes a long way to eliminating the need for people to go to extreme measures to be forcing their voices into the airspace. Thanks very much. So a couple of other examples about when things don't go quite as planned. Um, and, and certainly one of them was, uh, you know, they were planning a transportation workshop and they'd forgotten that a marathon was taking place right in front and their facilitators couldn't get to the site. So that was kind of fun. Uh, oh. and, uh, and another one just sort of along the line I mean, of... I'm, uh, I mean, I'm so sorry to interrupt. My computer is saying that an application error has occurred and so if, I if we drop off, we're going to do our best to come back on, but I just want to let you know that it's telling us that GoToMeeting is going to close in a second. So if you lose us, we'll be right back. Well, hopefully we should be good, and we're going to be closing off in a few seconds anyway. Um, so the the other one was just being careful about the types of, of tools you use. Someone was talking about a not so good experience with democracy, um, and then just there's there's just a few others. Um, but you wanted some feedback uh, about uh, what people liked about what they had heard today, um, and a lot of people like the types of smart. Uh, they're certainly going to be including that to be thinking about all of the different things they're doing. The multiple scenarios and, and, and you know, planning for part A, part B, part C uh, definitely resonated. Um, and mainly people are just saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Looking forward to uh, getting the resources. Um, and many people said thank you for your examples. Uh, that was just terrific. So I think with that, um, we're probably going to close it off. Brenda did just ask one quick question. When you prepare your participants with the background information, do you also include group norms or engagement rules? So that's an interesting question. Yeah, I usually don't do that um, with the background information, but we'll usually start uh, a meeting with some sort of group norms or, or um, guiding principles around how the meeting is going to be run. And I think you've got an, a decision to make at that point of whether you develop those as a group or if you present them to a group or if you don't talk about them at all. Frankly, my default is not to talk about them simply because I know if I'm a participant and somebody talks to me about ground rules, I all of a sudden divert into feeling like a five-year-old and I don't know quite why that is. So that might be just my baggage that I bring into a meeting of saying it feels to me like we're assuming people are going to behave badly so I will absolutely inject ground rules if people start to behave badly but I don't assume from the front end they're going to having said that if I really expect something to be contentious um, if people are working at small tables and I'm not directly facilitating each conversation but they're doing it themselves um, I try to pick out and I don't have time to do it with everybody I will try to pick out some specific things that I think are really relevant guidelines for that particular setting, not just the basic ones of, you know, be polite and don't interrupt, but really specific ones that give people permission, for example, to say, a friend of ours, Michael Wilkinson, calls it the Elmo rule, enough, let's move on. Somebody can, you know, hold up Elmo and say that's enough, or whatever it might be. Um, just be really careful about ground rules because they can be amazingly helpful and they can also come across as a little bit condescending. Thanks very much. So we are going to wrap up now. There was a couple of other questions about um, people having hidden agendas and, and how do you manage that or support that. And I think that reflects back, Rebecca, on the importance of process and, the, and, and in many cases expecting emotions in the room. Um, so again, back to your process, and you've provided us with lots of really great examples, um, both of you, uh, Kate and Rebecca. So thank you very, very much for that. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, to present today. It was always wonderful to have something so interactive, and I know it was a challenge to be doing facilitation online, but I think you've done a fabulous job. So thank you very much for that. Just quickly, and then I'm going to come back to both of you to sign off, just a quick reminder that next month we're going to have another Montreal Encore. This time, Anne Patillo will be joining us from New Zealand to reprise her popular session, Is Your Organization P2-Centric?
You'll learn some tips and insights for instilling a P2 culture in your company or organization so that public participation becomes the heart of its philosophy and actions. And that's going to be happening on Tuesday, July 11th at 11 a.m. Pacific. So, Kate and, and Rebecca, back to you for just last comments, and then we're going to say goodbye. Just want to say thank you very much for, uh, for inviting us to be part of this. And um, if people want to get in touch with me in the future, uh, I'm at kate.bishop at guelph.ca. Excellent. Rebecca. And I say the same. Please do keep in touch. I know that in an environment like this, it's, you know, with 100 people on the line, it's very hard to have a good conversation if you've got a particular scenario you want to talk about. And so uh, do track us down. And uh, if you've got specific questions, I'd be really happy to continue the conversation. Brilliant. Kate and Rebecca, thank you very much. On behalf of IAP2 Canada, IAP2 USA, and Australasia, we really, really enjoyed your presentation today. And don't forget, for those of you that are on the call today, uh, Drew will be getting in contact with you in about 24 hours to provide you with a survey um, and all of the information that Rebecca and Kate have spoken about on today's session. So thank you very much for joining us. Hopefully you'll come again in July. Take care. All the best.